another way to look at it. Yeah, and I was rather, once I was struck by that, I was rather curious. And so I did what's known as a SCED analysis on about 150 documents that NASA has published on their main site. Mm-hmm. I think it's down five layers or something. And I was struck by a particular thought. It is curious that NASA is not curious. When we think about it, our image of NASA are, uh, is this image of staid, uh, hardly flappable, hardly excitable engineering rocket scientists, right? right? Yep. Okay, and our emotional response to that has been engineered to be um, belief and, uh, and uh, uh, faith and so on. We have this real good relationship with them. What if that's not the case? What if it really shouldn't even be the case? And and you think about it, in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s, before we ended up with NASA, I think NASA was constituted in like 1958 or something when Eisenhower signed some documents, Mm -hmm. transferring over control from some other groups uh, to all things space going under the single agency. Yeah, right, I remember that. Yeah, prior to that, a lot of the scientists and engineers that one would have thought would have flocked to such an agency we're out writing great science fiction about basically what would life look like on other planets hmm. we had a plethora of ideas hmm. okay. and, and to a certain extent it is very bothersome that no such ideas are coming out of NASA now because NASA appears to be 100% uncurious about the potential for life in any other form than ours outside our planet why? I mean, that's strange. Exactly. It makes no sense in an agency that supposedly is devoted to all things space exploration. Yeah, right. The contact of, you know, this is not Star Trek. They don't have any kind of open idea at all. In fact, Hmm. they actually have gone to some great lengths, it would appear, to censor out any even hint of an enthusiastic view that might cause a speculation about life in some other format. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Now, that doesn't fit. The military has more published information prior to 1962, or excuse me, prior to 1968. Uh, there were more published documents speculating about alternate forms of life arising out of the military than exist in NASA today. The military had as a direct interest, you know, well, what if one of these little buggers dropped out sure. and we had to fight them? Right. And, you know, what would we look at? And there you get the War of the World scenarios, et cetera, et cetera. You don't see NASA participating in any of this. Why? So I find it extremely curious that they are not curious. Yeah, and why? they're not promoting a culture of curiosity. Why do you think? I think they already know. I do, too. Do, do you think that... In fact, I think they have proved that through their own language. Well, do you think that NASA is the, let's say, the front organization that keeps the the public happy, but that our true scientists, the true research, is going on way, way in the back room, and nobody knows what they're doing. I mean, uh, I have heard that they are so far beyond in their in their research and their abilities than than even they talk about that the average person would have no idea how truly advanced this whatever the organization is, because NASA would be, as I said, like like the front organization dealing with the public itself. Exactly. So what we're talking about is the hand in the glove of, that manipulates NASA. Yeah, right. And I would agree with you. And think about the disservice mm-hmm. that they're going to do to the civilization as a whole, because we've had no opportunity to acclimatize ourselves to a reality that would include life in some other form than ourselves, yet we live on a planet that's, that's ferociously populated with life in all sorts of forms. Yeah, I would say and so. so the idea should not be strange, but we, we don't have any mental construct in which to put this. So should it occur? Of course mass quantities of people are going to go nuts because oh, yeah. they've been reassured for you know the entire length of their life that such a thing could not occur from grand authorities, yeah. including NASA. And then all of a sudden, something is going to be dropped in their lap and that's something like you're you're at least alluding to Cliff is something that's so fantastic that, that it's appears that it indeed appears to be exactly the sort of scene that would would fit the criteria that we've got now well let me tell you it sure shake 
the you know what out of me too if all of a sudden you know we realize that and I know I know we've been lied to time and time and time again but but still in the back of your mind in the in the seat of your soul you're you hoping know why that is why? they have engineered that deliberately over the past 50 plus years with the language used to address the whole subject really yeah, of course right. because there are certain mm-hmm. psychological conditionings that can be applied onto the mind right and as right. I alluded to last time if you're not in control of your mind, someone else is. You got in that our case, right. it, it's the mind manipulators who populate advertising, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, who are told, ridicule this message, do it in such a way that there's a shame variant attached, and thus when people even think about considering that changing their worldview to accommodate this, yeah. shame arises. My gosh. Isn't it shame that you feel for even considering such a nut job theory? Jeez, yeah, you do. Sure you do. Guess where I read that. <laughs> I'm aware. I mean, US, U.S. War College. Honest to God. Oh, my gosh. Cliff, t- tell me before we get into some of the heavy stuff, what is going on in the world? I mean, there is... It's well, it's going to me. I'm an ignorant pig. Yeah, well, I'm behind you. So um, it just seems that that so much is happening on, on so many different levels. And, and, and the poor public at large worldwide... We have no idea. Yeah, we we talk because somebody sneaks out of the back room and they whisper something to a friend, and then it starts to, you know, go all around the town. But there there are some things going on that just defy explanation in any way. And I was just hoping, you know, that <laughs> that I might know something. Yeah, right. Well, I've got, I've got a context in which to place it. All right. That help. Okay, go. Okay, we know that indeed there is a huge amount of change going on and that change itself is accelerating. Uh, so okay. in, in terms of thinking about it, you can think that the rate of change is very fast and getting faster by the minute. One way to also look at this is that we're all in a headlong rush for what has been called the singularity. Hmm. And the singularity is a moment in which there's constant change erupting around you. Now, we need to put that into context within our bodies and our five senses. Mm-hmm. It need not mean that the whole world is constantly uh, shimmering in front of your eyes as things uh, change so fast you can't even reach out your hand to get your doorknob, but it may indeed mean that the change is so rapid that your mind uh, delivered its information through these five senses cannot cope. I believe that. Sure. Sure. Makes sense. Yeah. And I think we're actually... Like you said, Cliff, we're seeing the results of it now with with people going nuts. I mean, and thus, thus we have a huge pharmacological industry catering to trying to control the mind all about that. And oh. we know really to a certain extent that, um, I mean, if one gets into the history, one can go back and read vast quantities of literature in Sanskrit, thousands of volumes of which have never even been translated out of Sanskrit into any other language, about exacting techniques for mind control and the separation of mind from will and how to manage your life as an effective human aware of the reality rather than the illusion. And yet we find ourselves in a society where our education system has dumped everybody down since 1890. Yeah. In 1890, you could pick up any, any paper for weeks on end and all of the citizen response was all about the monetary system and the wisdom of going to paper currency. <laughs> Do you see such debates these days? No. Highly select few whose livelihoods depend on it, yes. But general citizenry worried about the structure and context of their life and the impact that paper currency might make on it? Wow. Imagine the children that are being educated today who can't even, half of them can't even pass the reading on the SAT test. That's right. Come up and say, well, let's have a, let's have a discussion about fiat currency, its history, and its application <laughs> in the current, current time. Yeah. Wouldn't that go over big? Exactly. Yeah. So, so why is that? Why is an education system? Um, I, I had the good fortune to have uh, the universe place me outside of this country during a great many of my formative years and was delivered an education that was, a uh, schooling rather, let me put it that way, a yeah. schooling that was very decent uh, and exceptional when considered to the American, standard American schooling at the time. So I came back very much a stranger in a strange land. Hmm. And uh, as a consequence of isolation, pursued learning the ability to learn. And so thus I could set my mind as a tool at any task and say, learn this, and it would have a set routine.
routine and develop more routines and alter them and challenge assumptions, and, and pretty soon I would know that. And we would apply this here. Now, as you say, what's going on? Yeah. Well, we're getting to a point where the pharmacological industry is providing chemical props to people to deal with abstractions that are coming in from, essentially, from their five senses, and they're not dealing with any of the issues that arise from that. Now, my supposition is that there may indeed be, again, an invisible hand that wants to direct all of this, such as why, you know, allow a neurotoxin like aspartame to be widely consumed. Uh, that's a real good question. Yep. Why are we in search of artificial sweeteners? If diet pop worked, no one would be obese. <laughs> that's very true, too. Okay, yeah. so along with all of these basic assumptions, we have the idea of reductionism, but... I think at a systems level, there are people out there very much aware of the systems and the cycles in which they operate, and they're attempting to do things for um, power. We might as well just call it naked power, I guess, yeah. uh, uh, which would benefit themselves and those who control their, their strengths. Hmm. And the real problem is that while universe in general has shown itself favorable to the existence of humanity over a long period, millions of years, right. that could be jeopardized if humanity doesn't get off its butt and get control of things. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. I mean, realistically, if we approach a singularity in which there's a, even a magnetic reversal on this planet the impacts of the reversal, the shredding and, sh and shedding of the protective layer of the magnetosphere yeah. and the uh, pumping up of the magnetic quotient of the planet as the poles rotate will cause vast levels of mental disturbance in all kinds of creatures, including humans. Yeah. Now we, we just got a very, very interesting email, and you may even know about this, but... Uh uh, Peggy Hurst just wrote it, and she heard it on one of Rens's shows last week. But it's, she says, just as the mushroom cloud is unmistakably characteristic of an atomic bomb explosion, a certain other type bomb, she can't remember which one, creates a characteristic dreadlock pattern. Long, thick, drooping tendrils of smoke form a perfect match for a full head of dreadlocks. The term That's dread kind of odd. Yeah. yeah, the term dreadlocks. Well, especially since our descriptor uh, goes on to say uh, as round as is, is tall. And I always thought, oh, poor fellow, you know, he's a little rotund. Oh, it says, the term dreadlocks is actually used to describe the explosion pattern as the mushroom cloud is used for an A-bomb. Cliff's dreadlock man could be metaphoric for a certain type of explosive. Very interesting, Peg. Thanks. Hmm. Which now that she scared me to my, uh, <laughs> my core, yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, very interesting. Uh, yeah, you see the associations mm. and you see the problem with the interpretation. Mm. You know, to a certain extent, we have to take things literally because, or actually, because we think that the language, the linguistic clues of bad water and force-driven yeah, waves, right. well, geez, that was probably, you know, uh, because I misinterpreted this storm and this tsunami, we missed that actual word, but pretty much otherwise had it. Oh, yeah, my gosh. Yeah. Um, Cliff, can you share some of the other things, interesting, shall we say, things that, that you have been able to pick up just recently? Well, we've come into a period where uh, it looks like, in a general sense, um, and tell me if we've discussed this before, uh, that we've got a generalized building of emotional tension within the populace of the USA that will occur with a couple of uh, fairly large up-and-down jumps, but uh, mostly a pretty steady upward build uh, through the fall and into early December. A lot of this seems to be geopolitical. Yeah. Uh, it's all within the greater context of militancy and secrecy revealed.